<clears throat> so hello, RUGS. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for the organizers to selecting me and, and this talk. Uh, I'm Saboj Sabojitot. You can find me on Twitter with that handle, underscore NEC. I work at the IBM Budapest lab, which was formerly called Ustream, but IBM acquired us, so now I'm an IBMer. As a senior engineer, uh, when I'm not working and not with my family or building Lego or playing, I organize these two conferences, GSConf Budapest and uh, now CSSConf Budapest 2. So, thank you. <laughs> so, about my talk. Uh, I have to tell you in advance that this talk will be not about Node.js, not even JavaScript. All this is based on my experience when I first wrote my first uh, Node.js based service at the company I work for and uh, pushed it to live production. So first I tried to implement a bunch of DevOps stuff within my application, then I learned not to. So this talk is about the tools uh, that may surround your Node.js application and uh, to help you make it more reliable, more secure and more scalable. So today's topics will be metrics, error logging, logging, secret storage, service discovery, process supervision, running programs, and connecting services. Some of you may know all what are these about. Some of you may know some of them. And for some of you, these may be totally new stuff like they're from me a year ago. So, but I hope all you can learn something new today. Let's start with the great topic, metrics. Metrics are a time-bound numeric representation of a software, hardware, or a network property. It can be anything like users currently using your application, or memory consumption, or network lag, or even software complexity can be represented as a number. Uh, as they are related to time, historical data and metrics can show the backstory of your application, your application development. So I recommend that you start collecting metrics as early as possible. Metrics are great because they are historical. You can reveal trends using metrics. Slow memory leaks, user growth, storage size. You can debug and go ahead. You can mark feature releases, like new code getting into production. You can see the results or the consequences of it. You can find out about anomalies, like gaps or spikes. They have a lot of meaning. Are they periodic, happening at the same time at every day, or just seem random? You can find out why. And you can set alerts and get notified if things get worse. Uh, all this data has to be collected and aggregated somewhere to have meaning. Delivering metrics can happen two ways. Either you push it to a service, or you just provide the data and let the service collect them. Since your application's job is not to send metrics anywhere, I guess, so you should let the metric service come and do the collection. This is called scraping. You just have to provide the data, and the scraper comes and happens, does this periodically. Some great tools for metric collection is Prometheus and Graphite. You can create queries and uh, so show nice graphs from both of them, but nowadays Prometheus is getting more and more popular, so I recommend you check it if you haven't uh, so far. From a node app's perspective, these are great ways to do metrics. Just put your metric data in an accessible web path, and you're done. Even the HTTP status code of these paths can be meaningful. If they are over 500, there's definitely something wrong. If they are around 200, then OK, everything is fine. Here are the metrics. There are node libraries that can wrap the embedded node uh, HTTP module. They can instrument it, and bam, you get just have these uh, out, uh, points on the, your web server, and you, they can collect it. They can collect the, the metrics. Sorry. Why we are here? Check out Grafana. It's a beautiful tool to show your metrics, and it's written almost fully in JavaScript. It's very, very nice. Some important metrics that we're collecting as early as possible, like latency, which is the time needed to serve your request that arrive to your service and you, the time is needed to re actually work with them and send a response. You have to find slow queries, find out when and why they happen, and then you can create performance tests on these queries. And when you have a test, you can iterate your code, retest again, and check if they are getting any better. If you do this, you can really, really improve your app's performance on the long run. Now, 
for latency and some other metrics you can collect, uh, it's important that you do not average the data. Use a histogram, because if half of the metrics are super crazy fast and the other half, I'm oh, sorry, the other half is just really slow, on the average, everything seems fine, but you know it's not. If you use a histogram, you can differentiate, see which, met, uh, which uh, requests should be focused on and have to work with them. The other important metric is resource usage. Resource usage. Their trends can predict when the resource will run short, so you can prepare for it. Now remember this, this is very important. Sending metrics is not the job of your application. So please keep it in mind. Next, remote error logging. The goal here at remote error logging is to catch the errors as fast as possible. Get alerts of errors in live production from services. See alerts during development. Uh, watch the error logs during feature testing. And more importantly, during releases. If you aggregate your incoming errors from all your services, you can see all these errors at the, at the surface. And you, can, you may find the connection between them, like which is the cause and which is the effect of the error. Uh, but most importantly, you have to catch the error before the user does, because that will cost you and your company money. Now, an ideal error report has the following data, more or less, like the environment of the error. Where is it happening? Is it happening at live production? Is it happening in a featured branch or testing environment? It, call, uh, it brings you a stack trace, so you can start debugging your code early on. And it may bring you any custom data that you might help debugging your code and finding the problem more, more, uh, more quickly. Now, if the error occurs, your application has to, has to push it to the error log. So we cannot do the scraping thing here because error can happen anytime. You cannot prepare for it like just collect the error logs periodically. No, you have to push it as soon as the error happens. Many libraries that report to error logging services can handle the unhandled exceptions. It is very important. Be careful with the logs because some environment variables may contain secrets. So they can be logged too. That's, that's a bad thing and implement some sampling or message throttling or a timeout because you can easily shoot yourself in the leg, well, in your leg. Uh, I met with a company before who did this, like, uh, they had this service that was working fine, but some little error happened and the service tried to send an error message to the error, connecting, error collecting service, <clears throat> but it couldn't send the message because some network problem or the, the error logging service was down, which uh, created another error in the service, which created another error in the service, which created another error in the service. So basically, it's just killed itself. So don't do this. Be careful. Some great tools, you might be familiar with them, like Airbrake, Sentry, Raygun, or Rollbar. We use Airbit because it's open sourced, but you have to host it yourself, and it's based on the Airbrake API. So you can use it with all the libraries that report to Airbrake. It's easy to integrate with Node, can handle the unhandled exceptions, and which are reported to the service just before the app crashes and exits. Now, fast and instant error reports are useless if the right people are not notified in time. Pager duty and chats like Slack or HipChat are ideal for this. If you use an error logging system, find out how to integrate it to Pager duty or Slack. And with smart integrations like Slack, the term chat ops was created, meaning you can acknowledge or escalate an issue right within the channel you were alerted. So it's pretty fast. Let's move on to logging in a more general way. Now, the difference between error logging and logging is you expect the logs. Logs are anticipated, but you don't expect the errors. They are occasional, but you can prepare for them. A good way to distinguish logs is their, and their context is losing log levels, but the simple log level names like fatal, error, etc., are relatively meaningless. So some great people on the internet suggested we should rename them, like fatal is la, wake me up at 4 a.m. at a Sunday, or warn is uh, apologize and raise a ticket. I love this tweet, by the way. It shows exactly what error log level should mean. So let's recap. Uh, Fatal needs instant intervention by the developer, by us, 
and we have to check the error logs. Error, we have to inform the user and we have to check the error logs. Warn, we have to escalate if, they have, if it happens again. Info is just a step in a normal work, workflow. Everything is all right, thank you. And debug, like <clears throat> fill the console with lines and stack traces. Use them wisely where they are really needed because if you use every error is fatal, then none of are. So be careful with that. But why is it good to do logging and do custom logging? Not just because debugging your code, it's obvious, but you can create and log custom events. So you can track the usage and the behavior of your application, what the users are doing with your application actually. This data can be used to profile, A-B test, and overall to further help further product development. So logging helps not just you and your peers, but the product development people and the UI UX developers too, or designers, sorry. <clears throat> Some relatively known logging libraries for Node.js, libraries like console log, yes, uh, from the simplest one to more elaborate stuff like Bragi. But in general, a good logger has to have timestamps, log levels, write to the standard output or the standard error, able to format the logs, it's very important, and create or accept a correlation ID. Now this last part is really important and quickly let me show you why. When a new request arrives from the user, we create an ID that will identify this request. This is the correlation ID. Now, we do our logging by sending this ID and referencing this ID to the logging server. After this, when our service uses other services in our environment, uh, they also add this uh, correlation ID to all the requests that goes out to these services, and so on and so on. So they always, always, always pass on this correlation ID to the other services. This way, all these services can do the logging to the same logging service. And at the end, if there is anything wrong, uh, we will see the whole flow of the single entry point where the user came to our service. You can see the whole process later in the logs. So you can see the correlation between them. This is why it's called the correlation ID. Uh, the right way to log. Just throw it out on the standard output, and I mean it. If you have used Docker or Kubernetes, they clearly encourage this behavior. Use a log collector that will process these and deliver your logs. You can pipe it to a log file if the log collector needs it, or you want to handle these files later. If you, if you can enable debug runtime, that's a great feature. You can use system signals to turn debug mode on on your application, so you can swoop in and start debugging a live environment anytime. And most importantly, be very careful with logging secrets. Uh, at many companies and many places, the policy of handling logs and handling of secrets are really different. So your logs may bleed secrets. Be careful with that. Some great log collectors out there that work similar, what a good log collector should do is like FluentD, Logstash, SysLogNG, and RSyslog. Like they should do what, she, what, what they should do. It's like read directly from standard output or log file tail, use the correlation ID you provide, and in general, they should remove the burden from transferring your logs. Now, these are separate processes on the host where your application is running, doing one job, watching the log output of your app, and delivering it to the remote logging service. Logging services like Stackdriver and Elasticsearch, both of them are uh, FluentD based. I've met with Elasticsearch so far. It's really easy to work with. I had to format my log output to a scheme that FluentD could interpret and pick up and de deliver the log to Elasticsearch where we could make queries and graphs from them. So remember, sending logs is not the part of your job, not the, part, the job of your app. I mentioned secrets and sensitive data a few times before. Uh, I would like to spend a little time around handling secrets. This topic can be relevant with any Node.js-based service. What are secrets from a developer's point of view? Like passwords and usernames for databases, even database names, these are pretty obvious. But API keys too, they provide access to services you, have, you are paying for. And private keys, which can use to access remote machines and services, they are really sensitive data. These are all considered sensitive data. So please, do not put your secrets into any of the following. Source code, private version control system, config files, they usually end up on a version control system anyway. Simple database fields. Where are the credentials to those databases? I don't know. 
And if possible, avoid putting them in environment variables or be very careful with them because they are easy to slip out through logging or error reporting. Use a managed secret storage if possible because it has many benefits. You can create access control lists, define people, services, who or what can see what secrets, what credentials. If there is a need to change a password in your system, you can do it in a single place and all your services will update accordingly. You can create single use case for a build or two use case like a build and a test or three or n use keys. You can provide a key that will expire after a time. You can keep an audit log, see what secrets were used, updated when by whom. And this can be used during runtime, so on your application startup, when there is no secret is stored on the disk. And you can use it like during build time. So you can request the secrets during your build and let the image or your compiled code uh, deliver the, code, uh, the secrets to your server. This might sound really complicated, but actually it's much simpler than that. We have our code ready in the version control system without holding any actual secrets. There is no passwords, nothing in there. All our secrets in the secret storage service. Now, we can use these two ways, either from a build server or the actual running application servers. This means we are either in build time or runtime. Both use cases, our source code arrives to the destination, but instead of actual secrets, it has names or keys or placeholders for the secrets. Now, the code in the build server or the code in the runtime ask the secret storage about these placeholders, authenticating with their tokens. This token can be easily rotated, revoked, and it doesn't contain any secret. It's just access to the, to the secret storage service. And using ACLs, access control lists, they can be used to access this subset of secrets only. They receive the actual secrets now, and we can move on and work with them. If we are at build time, the build is ready, deployed to the service nodes, and our secrets are in the deployed code. If we are doing this runtime, there is no secret stored on physical disk whatsoever, only in memory. Uh, this server in the middle, it has some really nice superpowers, like ensure safety with really, really powerful encryption. The whole set of storage, the whole secret storage, has to be unlocked when the server starts. So it actually needs a human intervention when it's starting up. This means they are useless and inaccessible, your secrets, without unlocking by any means, even if you physically compromise the server and rip out the disk from it. Some of these services you can use, like HashiCorp Vault, KMS from Amazon, Swarm from Docker and Kiwis. I work with Vault so far. It's pretty great, free and open source. You have to host it. And it works very well with Node or PHP or any programming language. And never store your secrets in your source code, please. There are plenty of examples of public GitHub searches for private keys, passwords. The lack of security is just frightening. Do not do this. Let's move on to another exciting topic, service discovery. Service discovery is a really great tool. Actually, it's a Swiss knife of service-oriented architecture. It can help you register service providers and notify other running services about them, holds a database of actually running services, and you can ask information about them, like their exact IP, host name, anything that's related to them. It does a basic monitoring because it has to know about the actual working services. And it's really useful when it comes to load balancing it helps you direct traffic and, uh, to the new, newly created nodes within your actual service. Service discovery system can act like a domain name server and resolve a simple domain to the least busy node that can fulfill a request. This is a really simple use case and can be really useful in an internal network. Or you can use it to create, update, and modify configurations on other services. This is a more complex usage. It's difficult to implement, more difficult to implement and more uh, complicated to maintain, but this way you have a total control on how do you use a service discovery system. Let me quickly show you how it works. On the host where your application is, there is a service discovery agent process called SD agent. Now, it checks some properties of your application like process ID or the port it listens on, anything you want, you can configure it really nicely. If your application becomes ready, your, the SD agent tells the service discovery registry that a new service is in the system. 
then the service registry then notifies all other SD agents that a new node is in the service. So some SD agents can update a metric collector to scrape metrics from the newly created node, and some SD agents can update a load balancer to direct traffic to the newly created node, so it can actually work. Now, the key to this is the service discovery agent, which is a separate process on the host where your application is running. They can be configured what to check, when to check, and it should not be the part of your application. Instead, it should be the part of your stack or configuration. Some great service discovery solutions are Zookeeper from Apache, Eureka from Netflix, Konzu from HashiCorp, Doozer or ETCD. Uh, it can be used to build a service discovery system. I've met with Konzu so far. I used it to update uh, load balancer configurations when my node service created, a, my, my new instance of a node service was created in a service and it reloaded the load balancer to actively start directing traffic to them. Registering services is not the job of your app. I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, let's talk a bit about running programs and keeping them running, which is usually called as process supervision. Simply to say, it's a system that keeps your app working, not just running. Your app can run, but actually be unresponsive for, from the outside. It watches and checks some property of your application, like process ID, that's pretty basic, to port, ping time, HTTP response codes, anything you want, you name it. And if anything looks bad, it restarts the app. But it does with some fail-safes, like trying a few times, then after giving up, so it won't spam you with error messages a whole day or a whole night long. <coughs> you may know these in node land, like PM2 and forever. It, they exactly does this, but they're usually focusing on node scripts. And some of them, like PM2, is a bit overcomplicated. They implemented an actual load balancer within the process supervision system. I don't know why. Now, Monit exists since a pretty few years now and can run and supervise any process. It's important it has a small footprint on your system, com very configurable, even has a small web interface it, if you want to start to play with it. So I really recommend it. But like every automation tool, process supervision also comes with a few compromises. You can use tools like Monit and your service is instantly restarted if there's a problem, but you might miss the reason of the error. Or you can rely on remote monitoring and swoop in and start debugging if there's a problem. This way you can easily find out what the problem was, but uh, the mean time to repair may get high and then your users will suffer. So it really depends on what error logging capabilities and debugging needs you have. Another related quick topic is how do you actually start your nodes on node service or any other service? Simple as that, a program runner or a daemon runner has to do only a few things stop and start the application, and know about the state of the app. Is it running or not? It has to be able to send signals to the application. You can use these system signals to do custom tasks, like turn on debug mode. You may know some of these already. I found about, uh, about Runit uh, a year ago, and was like, where was this tool when I was juggling with init scripts and start, stop daemon on Debian? Uh, Runit does what a simple and good program runner should do, like it's distribution independent, so you don't have to worry if your service is migrated to another Linux distribution. It's easy to config. For example, we run it, you just put your start command in a file, maybe any long, with all its parameters, and run it uses that file to come as a command to start and handles everything else, you're done. You don't have to check if actually it's running or is there a pit file or something, run it does everything for you. You just say stop or start, that's it. Previously, I talked about process supervision. Now, let's see how it teams up with actually running programs. Some program runners may be able to auto-restart your app if the process ID dies. Uh, but I would say to avoid that, because, uh, and let the super process supervisor do it. For example, if you use Monit and Runit, they do not know about each, each other's state. So if you let Runit auto-restart your application, that is, that is some, some problem, Monit can detect that there's a faulty up behavior and also initiate a restart. Now, this may lead to really weird race conditions. Monit has a broader view of your app, like ping times, HTTP statuses, and able to decide actually if the app needs a restart or not. So let Monit handle the restarts using simple Runit commands. Configuration-wise, you can keep the upstart script for Runit and the checks for Monit nicely separated. 
In my last topic, I'll uh, try to help you decide how to connect your services within your application. Uh, the goals are here are simple. We should decouple our services, loosen up the connection between them, so we can scale more easily and more fast. The two great methods to achieve this is using HTTP-based APIs or communicating over message queues. When we use HTTP APIs, we do simple HTTP requests over the network. Our service too is scaled uh, to run on several nodes, which are located behind the load balancer. And when service one sends a, or a user sends a request to the service two, the load balancer picks an available node from the service two nodes and directs the traffic to that node. If the traffic increases, we can spin up new nodes for service two and use service discovery to update the load balancer so everything runs smoothly. Now, if we use a message queue, our services put their requests and responses to a really fast message queue. The nodes of service two watch this queue and pick up the requests from the coming from service one as they come. When traffic increases, we can spin up new nodes, and as they become ready, they will go to the message queue and start picking up messages. Configuration is simpler here, but both solution has its benefits and downsides. So which one should you choose? Well, it depends. HTTP APIs can be synchronous and asynchronous, which is a great thing. They are usually located on remote locations, and they can be opened up for public use. Message queues, on the other hand, are usually asynchronous, but you can implement them in a way that they may seem synchronous. They are usually located on a single closed network, so they might work better for connecting services internally within a larger application or a larger service. The best thing with message queues is the really, really low latency. Throwing and delivering messages in the queue happens really, really fast. So consider your needs and goals and pick one for the right job. I would like to finish with some lessons I've learned while going live with our first Node.js-based service. Uh, feel free to play around, prototype, learn. Use any module for NPM you want to use. But get ready to go to production to an already established scalable environment where the ops people have already set some basic groundwork for you. If you do this, you will be able to scale and scale up more easily. It's important to focus on the task your app is supposed to do. Don't bother with sending logs, metrics, or pinging service discovery systems. I did this first, and then took a look at the metrics and started to wonder, OK, I see the memory consumption, I, I can see the CPU usage, but what is the footprint of actually delivering these metrics? So of the CPU usage, what was used to collect these numbers I'm right now looking at? Delivering all this data and the metric of the actual application, what is the footprint of this? Uh, I could not separate them by just looking at the numbers, so keep this footprint at a minimal and uh, keep it simple. And lastly, go to your ops people, meet them, befriend them, talk to them. They are here to actually run your application. They can help you a lot and get on a common ground with them. And after this talk, I hope you'll get along and ask the right questions. I would like to thank our DevOps experts, Peter and Ferenc, who I work with, and who are from whom I learned a lot in the last year. And they also helped me to go over these slides and provided a tremendous help and great suggestions. If you have any questions, let's talk. Come find me around the venue or the party. And uh, I have some Jets of Budapest stickers left if you want some. Or join us in Budapest in less than two weeks. Thank you. <laughs>